Well, good evening and welcome to the Commemorative Air Force Warbird Tube webinar for tonight. I'm your host, Steve Bus, and certainly glad that you could join us. Uh, this webinar series is made possible by the Commemorative Air Force. You can support CAF through membership or donations. And for details on how you can further CAF's mission to educate, inspire, and honor, please visit our website at commemorativeairforce.org. Now, as you enjoy tonight's presentation, some questions may come to mind. If you have a question, just type it in the chat box, or if you're listening or watching on one of the other platforms uh, in the chat or uh, a comment section. And uh, Leah Block, who's in Houston, is kind of keeping an eye on all of that, and she will relay the questions to us, and we'll get them answered either within the uh, presentation or we'll save time at the end uh, for your questions. And uh, joining us tonight, we have uh, three guests from historic Wendover Field in Wendover, Nevada, uh, Jim and Tom Peterson and Landon Wilkie. Gentlemen, good evening. Good evening and welcome to the uh, webinar. Good evening. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. I'll, I'll just make one correction. We're in Utah. Oh, in Utah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Across the border. Yeah, the airbase. The airbase was all, uh, all 1.8 million acres was all in Utah. Okay. Well, um, let's start with you, Jim. Just give us a, a brief uh, background on on you and uh, aviation. <clears throat> Well, actually, my background is electrical engineering and computer science, but I worked for the Air Force. I worked in a, at a defense company for the Air Force early in my career, so that's uh, that's kind of where I got my interest in all of that. Plus, I'm a private pilot, and uh, we just uh, saw this airfield that was so famous and just falling apart, so we thought we'd jump in and see what we could do. That's... Uh, uh, that's kind of my kind of my story. I've, I mean, I did this after I retired and got out of my engineering career. But uh, so now it's another career. It just it doesn't pay as well. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, Tom, how about you? Um, so I I'm Jim's oldest son, and I my interest in it was really I I wanted to fly F four Phantoms off of carriers. Uh, right up to the point that Top Gun came out, and then I wanted to fly F-14s, <laughs> but uh, diabetes got to me first. So uh, I've just always had an interest in history, and when we visited the air base in 2000, uh, this it just really uh, drew me in, and, and the World War II history. Uh, I have a grandfather that's a veteran, a World War II veteran, so that that really drew me in, and I've Loved it since. Plus, Tom's, right. got a, Tom's got a degree in history, so. Ah, okay. Yeah, that's true. And Landon? So I have both a bachelor's and master's in history with a emphasis in public history and aviation specifically. Mm -hmm. So to be here at the most original Army Air Force training base left in the country is absolutely amazing. And I'm Happy to be the curator, get to play with artifacts, and be a part of the preservation of this base. That's awesome. And uh, because this is sort of a, 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 it's the history of the field, but also uh, in a, in another webinar that we're going to do later on in the fall, we're going to talk about the restoration effort, what you've already done, and what's to come. But uh, tonight, we want to concentrate just on, on the history of this historic field, and uh, I guess we'll uh, let you uh, kick off the presentation. Okay, so you'll you'll give me just a small amount of excuse if I struggle a little bit presenting. So uh, let me get that up. Okay, and I apologize, Steve. How, which button gets me to share my screen? Oh, it's it's already shared. Okay, great. So hopefully we're looking at two uh, very attractive ladies standing behind uh, the air base sign in Wendover, Utah. And we are. And these, I'm right. These are these are actually two of the base uh, phone operators. Uh, and th they took the opportunity to take a picture to let their families know where they were. And as, as you can tell from the tropical paradise behind them, 
uh, kind of the, the circumstances in which uh, Wendover is established. So Wendover started uh, around 1907 as a stop for the Western Pacific Railroad. Uh, and the reason for that was this was an easy place to get water for the freight trains as they came across. And, and by easy, uh, if you include a 23 mile pipeline of, for water, that, that's easy, but it brings it to this day, it brings water from Pilot Springs, which is some distance away from the airfield. Uh, fluctuated about 1940 or about give or take 100 people, uh, mostly working for uh, the railroads. The Lincoln Highway did not come through Wendover until a little bit later. So it was, if you weren't associated with uh, the railroad or um, loved being out in the middle of nowhere, you probably weren't here. Uh, but that grew to almost 20,000 at the peak of the war. And this is Joe Connell, who was with her husband here in Wendover uh, about 1942, standing at the Nevada state line. So the, the base really got its start in 1939. The Army Air Corps and Congress realized that war clouds were clearly on the horizon and that we needed a place to train heavy bomber groups and, and young men. They actually thought about starting in at what would become Salt Lake International, but quickly realized that inexperienced pilots and four engine bombers in close proximity to a, a major city were, were not a good mix. So uh, Wendover was chosen. We have more than 300 good flyable days a year. Because it's on the salt flats, it's a good, uh, uh, most pilots will tell you it's a great easy approach. Uh, there's not a whole lot of uh, obstructions coming in for a landing either in almost any direction. and. Uh, in addition, uh, it, it's close enough to the West Coast to be able to immediately respond to any trouble, but it's far enough inland that the enemy at the time couldn't even, uh, you know, you'd, even with a carrier sitting right on the coast, they couldn't reach into, into Wendover. Mm -hmm. And this, again, this image gives you a, a good idea of the environs here. Now, this next one is Wendover in 1940. Uh, this is after the base has been established as a sub depot of uh, Fort Douglas in Salt Lake. Uh, you can, and again, if you come to Wendover today, uh, this foreground will be filled with uh, buildings and houses, but that distance view has not changed one bit. Uh, it, it looks just like that. So, as I said, it started uh, as a Fort Douglas sub depot, and I do have. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna betray my age here, and put on some reading glasses and read you a quick quote. And this gives you an idea for the where they were. This is Byron Dusler, who served at the airfield. He said we were sent to a bombing range on the desert, about 75 miles west of Salt Lake. To reach the bombing targets, we drove where there were no roads. The salt flats were quite level, but mountains were visible in all directions. The low flat surfaces of sand and salt glare in the sunlight, and on them nothing grows. On sand hills where the salt has been bleached out, scraggy clumps of sagebrush hold each hillock. What fantastic mirages one sees. Cool ridges, Kubla Khan, comes to life. I saw an enormous lake with islands in it of orange colored rock rising abruptly from the water. On the shores, reeds and rushes grew, but the colors were all wrong. Only in dreams can one see such an unnatural place. Of course, it was unapproachable. It always receded into the distance or else disappeared altogether. Uh, I dreamt I saw trees, but as we drove toward them, they vanished. So it, it's not not much has changed. <laughs> it's still a lot like that in in many areas. But as they came out, it was just a very small sub depot. Um, they uh, 
as, as, as Jim said, ultimately it became 1.8 million acres of training range and base, much of which is still part of the Utah Test and Training Range. Um, and, and they just really built out of nothing. This is our uh, picture of the first PX building in Wendover. Uh, and as you can see, it's, uh, it's what was classified as temporary wartime construction. It was sided with plywood and then covered with tar paper. And the lines are strips of wood lath to help hold down the, the tar paper in the winds we get out here in Wendover. This is early 1942, and these are the bachelor officer quarters. And uh, these four buildings, two of them are still here uh, and we're uh, someday, uh, next session we'll talk about restoring those. But again, this, this building in the foreground gives you a good feel for that tar paper and lath uh, construction. This is an aerial view of the airfield. Uh, on the right hand side, you'll see the one of the runways and the base proper down at the bottom center. Um, about this time, you're looking at officers quarters, uh, about four enlisted barracks, mess hall, some admin buildings. There are about four or five ordnance buildings, base theater, dispensary and bombsite storage building. And so that, that gives you the, the going concern of the day. Uh, then of course, December 7th. Um, it's interesting in one of the records we have uh, a gentleman who was assigned to Wendover prior to the war, arrived home after leaving Wendover, being discharged on December 6th and was actually recalled to Wendover and served the entire war in Wendover. Uh, on December 8th. So as we all know, that was uh, a momentous pivot for the world and for Wendover. From a handful of buildings to over 600 buildings, uh, Wendover, I don't want to say grew overnight, but very rapidly. One of the interesting stories, and, and I have to tell you to take a small grain of salt, uh, one uh, Western Pacific train stopped in Wendover with a load of lumber uh, and the crew got off the train, went up to the casino for dinner and, and in the night. Uh, and the colonel in charge of the base supposedly gave the order to liberate the lumber to build the base. And uh, you can imagine the looks on the crew's face when they arrived the next morning to find a few uh, flatbeds missing their loads and buildings going up on the base. So uh, I, I can't offer you any solid proof that that happened, but uh, it's been told enough that I'm comfortable saying I can't imagine it not happening. But uh, it grew uh, multiple, there were a couple church buildings, mess halls, like I say, barracks, all of these things quickly built uh, as it quickly grew. Um, again, this is this is our operations building and tower, both of which are still here. And again, you get a good idea of that tar paper uh, and lath construction or protection on the side of the building. Uh, and a good old ambulance out there in front. The tower uh, visitors today can still go up in the tower. Uh, and when we've had air shows in the past, uh, it's an active tower. So. We're kind of proud of that piece. Uh, as the base grew and so many people came, uh, the need for housing outstripped the availability of materials. And this is a view of the, the trailer court uh, at the northwest corner. Uh, and literally, they parked trailers uh, and crews, uh, especially officers who were able to bring their wives uh, lived in this in this area, as well as people who were serving on the base. Uh, you can see the rail spur down here at the bottom right hand corner that kind of led down to the fuel depot for the base as well. 
Uh, this is the hospital complex, much of which still remains. Uh, all the hospital buildings are in white. 300 beds, uh, you name it, uh, it, was, it was served here. Uh, dental, surgery, uh, nurses and officers, uh, quarters, as well as a mess hall. Now up on the right-hand side of the view here is enlisted barracks. Uh, this last section here uh, is still is still standing. Much of that is still standing, uh, and we're in the the process of restoring the mess hall. Uh, but that's it's a unique place where today you can walk into a barracks and say this is the place where these guys were. Uh, it's it's a very unique feeling. Um, one that one that can't help you can't help but be just a little bit emotional to think uh they were here it, it's not a recreation so that's kind of kind of exciting wendover uh played host to about 21 bomb groups uh, and i hate to say that i don't know what bomb group this is but this is our hangar number three uh, and a great looking group of guys on a b-17 uh, and here we have a, a good looking group of guys in front of a B-24. Uh, mostly B-24 groups trained in Wendover, although there were a number of B-17 groups. And uh, in 1942, these are the first four groups that were trained in Wendover. And as you look there, you'll see a couple notable groups, the 306th, which became first over Germany, uh, as well as uh, had a member who earned the Medal of Honor. Uh, the 308th, which was uh, part of Chenault's private air force uh, in the China-Burma-India theater. And of course, the famous Bloody 100th bomb group. Another unique thing about the 306th is Colonel, uh, at the time, uh, Colonel Curtis LeMay served a few months here in Wendover, which would prove to be kind of a pivotal event later in the history of the base. Uh, 1943, things kind of warmed up for training. Each bomb group served about two to three months in Wendover as part of their training. And as you can see, uh, they were pretty busy. Uh, a lot of them overlapped, uh, and the, the base was just really swamped with, with training. In the 43 to 44, uh, slowed down significantly. And in 1944, uh, there was one P-47 group that did training in Wendover for a very short time prior to uh, being dismissed by some brand new B-29 group, the 509th. Um, and I think unique to that last group of B-24, the 494th, which uh, served in the Pacific, were known as Kelly's Cobras. Uh, they actually had a bomb crew that would be killed in the Hiroshima blast. They had been shot down and were interned at Hiroshima Castle. And so unfortunately, uh, they were at Hiroshima Castle on August 6th. So it's as I look at these numbers, and, and, and I have to be honest, as a young man, the planes were what got me excited. Uh, it's kind of a, you know, the, the sexy P-51. Uh, somehow I found the bombers exciting too. Uh, but as I learn and as I spend time out here, uh, it's the people, it's the, it's the individuals that really tug at your heartstrings. You think of these young men, you think of the older men with families at home uh, that served here and many never came back. Some of them, some of them didn't leave Wendover due to training accidents. So that that's for me, that's the part that really pulls me in and makes this a unique place. So uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Landon who knows infinitely more about about the training uh, and the exercises and kind of the daily life that happened here in Wendover. Well, 
Well, thank you, Tom. Let's see if I can get my screen up here. Is it working? Okay. Yes, it is. <laughs> so I want to start off with something uh, Tom brought up, which is an individual I bet most of you have heard of, that Curtis LeMay. So yeah, as Tom mentioned, he was a deputy commander here with the 306 Bomb Group for a number of months as Wendover was just getting its start. So if you know his character, you'll find this quote all the more entertaining. But as he was trying to get these, a remark he made about his time in Wendover was, it was a great place to land and take off. That's about all you could say for it. In fact, you so much as looked and you wanted to take off right away. So it certainly was enough to snuff for, you know, one of the fathers of bombing doctrine, LeMay, but we certainly expanded from there. Um, at its peak, we had about 18,000 airmen and 2,000 civilians staffing the base. So that's a lot of guys to keep track of. So we'll get a bit more into what that heavy bomb group training entailed. So heavy bomb groups were the B-17s and B-24s, those four-engine bombers. When the B-29 came along, it dwarfed those, so they had to throw in a new name and call them the very heavy bombers. But we trained 20 of these groups. This was kind of what they typically consisted of, these numbers here on the screen. And this is a full force group. I don't think many, if any of the ones that passed through Wendover ever actually attained, you know, this total personnel of over 2,200 individuals. I think typically we had maybe 12 uh, aircraft per squadron, that kind of thing. So that's what we were doing from 1942 until 44. So the way that worked is we would have all of the individuals in a bomber crew, they would be training around the country. You might have pilots training on four engine bombers in Texas. You might get bombardiers training in New Mexico, gunners in Vegas, navigators in Kansas. So they're all going through the steps and then you get to a second phase training base like Wendover and that's where they, as you see on the right hand side of the screen, start training as a team and become one combat group. So the bases like Wendover were essential to making sure that there was success overseas as these guys headed into combat. This is one of the final phases. So these were called operational training units and the three main factors that they were involved in were reinforcing individual specialties. So they did that both after they were put into their air crew that they were going to be flying overseas with. They continued honing those abilities in the air, but we also had a lot of simulated training that I'll show you a bit more here in a couple slides. So they're doing that. They're learning to work as a team. As you hear a lot of these stories, many of these guys really didn't like each other, even on a crew. But what we find is that wasn't the most important thing. You didn't have to like each other. You just had to be able to trust each other as you were going into this situation and know that they were at least going to do their job whether they liked you or not. And then, of course, we have the overall operations working as a air crew, as a squadron, and as a group. So this is where they start practicing high-altitude formations, high-altitude bombing. And then from here, they're getting ready to ship out overseas. So one of the things that made Wendover so spectacular for this kind of training, Tom already mentioned, we had over 300 blue sky flying days a year on average. And then this flat land made it very easy to set up bombing ranges. Oftentimes, you could even just drive around in the salt flats or this soft ground, and that would be enough to start making some concentric circles that could serve as your target. Otherwise, it might be as simple as using pouring some used oil as you drive around in circles so that that can be seen from the air. We've also had multiple reports of there being cities of salt, of there being ships, and all these other things 
spread out there throughout the big bombing and gunnery range for these guys to actually train with. So there was a lot going on in Wendover. To show you the scope of what this heavy bomber training looked like, so typically as that other slide showed you, a full force bomb group would have 72 aircraft. So in this picture right here, we've counted about 125 aircraft. There's a mix of uh, B-17s and B-24s, as well as some smaller aircraft. So they're certainly keeping busy. There was regularly an overlap between two bomb groups. So you can just imagine how they were trying to juggle that. Hopefully you can see my mouse on the screen. Right here I'm circling our main flight line of hangars, most of which is still standing. So these four identical hangars right here, those were called our squadron maintenance hangars. So every squadron for a group during their duration here training for several months, they would be assigned one of those hangars. That's where they would base their maintenance out of. And next door to each of those would be a squadron headquarters, a smaller office building. So each of those hangars only fits a single bomber. Those are 120 feet wide. A B-24 has a 110 foot wingspan. So, I mean, you don't have much space to work with. They would put planes in there for major overhauls, that type of work. And the rest of the planes were parked outside, like you see, down the ramp, down taxiways. So imagine baking out there in the heat as you're doing repairs or in the winter, freezing. Such was the life of our airmen in Wendover. So some of the synthetic training aids that we were able to offer here in Wendover most of you have probably heard of the Link Flight Trainer system. So that's really how these pilots learned how to fly on instruments. So they hop into this little doodad. It has a hood that goes over top of them. It's up on air actuated bellows. And as he moves his joystick, or for the bomber ones, they actually had a yoke. He's flying a course given to him by instruments. In that little thing, it actually moves so he gets the sensation. Then you can see the instructor standing in front of him he has this little device here that actually draws out the course on a chart so that the instructor knows if he's following the course he's supposed to. So we had some of that training available here in Wendover. In the middle, we had bombardier training. So today what we call our historic fire station was originally used for bombardier training, had, had similar construction to this one you see in the picture, and it was full of these A2 trainers. They're basically 12 foot tall scaffolds that are going to drive along the floor to simulate a moving aircraft. And up top of there is the bombardier looking through his bomb site uh, at this little moving target called the bug or markings on the ground. And supposedly these would even shoot a rubber plunger so that uh, you could see if your trajectory was on or not. So they had that level of training. And then we had four of these towers here on the right hand side of the picture. These were used for celestial navigation training. I mean, when you think about um, simulation in the 1940s, I don't think this crosses a lot of people's minds. This is, for the time, very state-of-the-art. So in the middle, we have a mock-up of a cockpit with a pilot, co-pilot, radio operator, and a navigator. Sometimes they could even fit them out with a bombardier. Above them is a dome with um, constellations on it. It moves mechanically. So as they're flying their course, he can actually, the navigator can be plotting his course by sextant, looking at those artificial stars. And then below them is the projected moving Earth, so he can be clocking true airspeed and that kind of thing. These even had fog machines for cloud cover. So, I mean, Wendover had it all. In addition to our main bomber training, when we got going in early 42, the Army Air Force also said to our commander at the time, Colonel Dippy, so you're getting this base established for heavy bomber training, but while you're at it, uh, do you think you could build a, an, a flexible aerial gunnery school? We don't have any money for you, but if you could go ahead and do that, that would be fantastic. So Tom mentioned some of that possible pilfering from trains and that kind of thing. No doubt that was happening to make this aerial gunnery school possible. And at the time that it really got finished, and it was just within a matter of weeks that they had it up to full operating capability, um, they had a world-renowned gunnery school, at least for a time there. And it was all stuff that they just mod-podged together. So on the left was a device called the Tokyo Trolley. 
So up on this gunnery school, which is on a hillside just north of Wendover, they had a semicircle of a track that this train car would go up to 40 miles an hour on back and forth. Has three guys there with, I think, 30 uh, caliber machine guns. And they're firing at moving targets. Down here on the bottom, you can see how these moving targets were set up. So we have a Jeep that's mounted on a track. So there did not have to be a driver, fortunately. And it's driving behind this berm of sandbags with a target on top. So of course, these guys all have painted bullets. So as they shoot, they can see who's hitting the target or not. So they're shooting from a moving platform at a moving target. And at the time, I mean, that was one of the best recreations on the ground of air-to-air -air combat. So the fact that they just whipped that together with an old mine cart, if you see the driver's seat, that's just a five-gallon Pepsi syrup can. They really just put things together. They had a couple of power turret ranges. So any turret that you would find on a bomber at the time, they had mounted up there on this mountain. And a lot of them were pointing at these moving target ranges. And we hear as people went and investigated some of these crash sites later on of some of these bombers that went down, uh, surprisingly, some of the turrets were missing. It's suspected a lot of those ended up on this range as well to make it possible. So again, at the time, Wendover was surprisingly large. In July of 1942, Wendover hosted the largest mass graduation for the US Army, not just the Army Air Force, but for the Army. Um, a promotion from sergeant to staff sergeant of the numbers on here somewhere. It's like 140 um, aerial gunners. So it was a big deal here in Wendover. So, of course, unfortunately, along with this training, there were a number of incidents that occurred out here. Uh, this is one of the unique ones, a B-24 as it was crash landing for whatever reason. It hit the railroad tracks. Ten minutes later, the Western Pacific Railroad came along that main line and derailed as a result of those tracks being torn up. So our crash crews kept plenty busy. This is another interesting one. Tom actually just finished building a beautiful model with acrylic water on here. Um, so this, you can tell this is sitting out on water. One of the things that our area is known for is the Bonneville Salt Flats, where they set a lot of the land speed records. Well, at certain times of the year, um, the water will just sit on top of that because it doesn't like to absorb into that really alkaline soil. So when this B-24 happened to crash out there, there's a few inches of water. That's what it's sitting on. The only fatality in this incident was actually a drowning on the Bonneville Salt Flats. One of the gunners was knocked unconscious, fell face first into the water, and drowned before anyone could get to him. So that really kind of highlights the kind of things that were going on here in Wendover. When we go out to our barracks with a group, we like to emphasize, I mean, this is where you're building bonds, you're sharing bunks, someone's either right above you or right next to you in very close quarters, but some days you might show up and their mattress is rolled up and all their personal effects are stuffed back in their footlocker ready to be sent home because an entire, maybe an entire crew or more crashed and was lost. And these are the guys that you've been building friendships here in Wendover over the course of this time. So that's one of the sobering thoughts to think about. Um, an example of one of these relationships with the 399th Bomb Group, which was a replacement training unit. So these guys trained here in Wendover, but then they got broken up to fill in holes overseas in Europe where crews had been lost. Um, there was a B-24 crew. They were flying a training mission, and somehow, September 23rd, 1943, their tail gunner by the name of Staff Sergeant Wilfred Henninger somehow got entangled in his uh, tail gun apparatus and was strangled to death, which they really didn't find out until too late. They couldn't get back on the ground and do anything to save him. So that the rest of the crew got permission to fly to this guy's hometown in Star Valley, Wyoming, to attend the funeral. And in regards to paying their respects for this individual, their friend that they had been training with and building these bonds, they actually named their aircraft the Star Valley in honor of him and his hometown. And this is a story that came along to the daughter of one of that crew who almost immediately after they got shipped overseas was shot down and the rest of the crew was lost. That illustrates some of these bonds going on. 
So after our heavy bomber training concluded in early 44, we then for a short time took on the 72nd Fighter Wing. They were training in P-47 Thunderbolts. Here's a number of those incidents, because it just so happens when you give a young guy a very powerful plane, things happen. And I was actually just going through our, a list of crash reports. We just got about 90 of them from the Air Force that we're going through um, between the P-47s and our heavy bomb groups. Just within a two or three year time span, we lost um, over 130 individuals in these crashes. So one of the important parts of saving a training base like this is helping remember all those guys that didn't make it overseas. So I'll conclude with heavy bomber training there and we can turn it over to Jim. All right, thank you. All right, have we got my screen up there? Yes, we do. Good enough. So the Manhattan Project comes to Wendover Air Base. Just in case you hadn't seen this photo, I thought I'd show it one more time. <laughs> so the 72nd Fighter Wing was there. They were there for a very short period of time. Uh, and what happened is <clears throat> the following memo. This is from Captain Deary to General Groves, uh, 29th of August, 1944. He says, we've selected a base for the Manhattan Project. It's gonna be Wendover Field. Uh, at the bottom here, it says the 393rd Squadron is gonna be under the command of Colonel Montgomery. Now, you may have thought that it was Colonel Paul Tibbetts, but the memo says Colonel Montgomery. However, if you go to page two, at the bottom, they made a quick decision and they advised uh, that uh, Colonel Montgomery was gonna, not gonna do it. And they uh, chose Colonel Paul Tibbetts to uh, run this 509th composite group. So they arrived at Wendover Field. Uh, Colonel Tibbetts took over this building 211, the base headquarters. Uh, that building still stands today. It's not part of the museum. Maybe someday we'll be able to, to uh, get that to be, be part, of the, part of the museum. <clears throat> so the Manhattan Project at Wendover, uh, Wendover was known as Site K, or it was also known as Kingman. Uh, what took place at Wendover was part of the Alberta project, which was the project to take that engineered bomb that had been engineered at Los Alamos and turn it into an actual deliverable weapon. There were two, two parts to that, of course, the 509th composite group that flew the B-29s and all their associated uh, uh, parts of that. And then the 216th base unit special which was a group that uh, constructed and did test drops on, uh, on these bombs. When the group got there, of course, the first thing that Colonel Tibbetts did was to make sure that everybody understood just the, the high level of security. This, this sign had been seen in, in uh, aircraft factories too, but he put it up here so that People realized when they leave their post, they're not to talk about uh, what went on at Wendover at all. Well, of course, and this is another another shot of the of the base. Uh, in and this is this is actually 43, but in in 44 there was not a uh, <clears throat> hangar big enough for a B-29. We've got some of the actual original drawings of that. Uh, B-29 hangar from October of 44. That hangar was built and operational by March 1 of 45. And that's that's a picture of that hangar uh, just right after the war. So the 509th Composite Group consisted of the bomb squadron, the 393rd, which had been pulled out of Fairmont, Nebraska. 
uh, the 320th Troop Carrier Squadron that had uh, five C-54s, the Air Service Group, the Engineering Squadron, uh, Air Materiel Squadron, the, Miller, the MPs, and the First Ordnance Squadron, which also assembled these bombs. And actually, the First Ordnance Group assembled the final deliverable weapons on the island of Tinian. Well, the assembly project at Wendover was referred to as Project W-47. And that was a project to assemble and test drop uh, various versions of the little boy and the fat man. Uh, they didn't call them bombs. It was the gadget, or they had, they had other names for it. This particular shot is uh, lowering one of the bombs into, a, into the, one of the pits at Wendover. <clears throat> this one is painted black and white. What they ended up doing is photographing these. Part of the mission at Wendover was to bomb from 30,000 feet, or to learn how to bomb from 30,000 feet instead of the 17 to 20,000 feet that the 17s and 24s had been bombing from. So they needed to work on their accuracy. They discovered that these bombs wobbled on their way down. And uh, part of what they did is to change the tail fin design so that they were more aerodynamic and the bombs just fell smoothly as they came down. So it went over, this is, again, this is the original uh, configuration of the, of the runways, typical of Army Air Corps runways, Army Air Force. Uh, they had an X and then, and then a third runway so that there was always uh, always a 120 degree runway that whatever the winds were, you could land. There were, and, and these still exist at Wendover, there are three bomb pits, these two that have hydraulic systems in there, and then this small bomb pit, which we saw in the, in the earlier, earlier photo. There's, you can see the pit right there. Uh, and then the, the assembly of the bombs actually took place in what they call the South Base technical area. I've got it outlined in uh, a dotted outline there. That, that's where the assembly buildings were. Really that whole, this whole area out here on the, in the south was the, was the south base technical area. So there, there's that little triangle where they had the assembly buildings. There were also two other uh, assembly buildings even further away. When they build a fat man with the 6,000 pounds of high explosive around that tiny little core, uh, they wanted that even further away from the base. So they had two buildings here with copper floors to reduce the static. And that's where they assembled those prototypes with the, with the high explosives. Uh, again, the bomb loading, uh, a fat man bomb is five feet in diameter, 10 feet long. You just can't put it on a bomb loading cart and roll it under the plane, it's too tall. So that's why we had to have these bomb pits with a hydraulic lift in the bottom. The bomb would be loaded into the, into the pit on a carriage, plane backed over the, over the pit and then hydraulically pushed up into the plane and latched in the bomb bay. The bombs, uh, there, there's, there's thought that what went on at Wendover is that the 509th just practiced dropping bombs. These bombs were much, much more sophisticated. This particular photo you can see up in the top is the clock mechanism. There are basically eight clocks in there. Here are the wires that connect to the bomb bay. When the bomb drops, those pull out, activate the clocks. You can see two of the four radar altimeter units. There were four radar altimeters to measure the distance from the ground so that it would explode at 1,800 feet above the ground. And then back here is our six barometric sensor systems. So here's one of the test boxes that as they're putting this all together, uh, trying to make sure that it's going to work. And, on, and many of these test drops had to do with uh, the altimeter detonation system to make sure it worked properly. The other thing they did at Wendover is that the bomb bays had to be modified 
that you had to either be able to put a fat man bomb in this picture of a fat man bomb in the bomb bay and you can see the sides of the bomb bay it, they actually had to put some rub rails in there so that, that it would just kind of contain the bomb so you had to be able to put a fat man bomb in or you had to be able to put a little man little boy and all 15 of the atomic mission planes needed to be configured to that so the 603rd engineering group at Wendover worked on uh, worked on that, uh, that that particular aspect of these bombs. Down here, I'm not, down here in the corner, you can see one of the spray sway braces for the Fat Man bomb, and there's a guy with his arms out there doing working on something up there on this on this little boy. Uh, all the bomb groups, this is just one of the photos. This is Tom Klassen, who is the deputy commander of the 509th group. The bomb, they're having their picture taken in front of the B-29 hangar. And all of the groups had their, had their photos taken at Wendover. Uh, the, the group really, uh, Tibbets got there in September. Uh, officially, they didn't start till December, but... Uh, they did start doing some work in October, November. They ended up leaving Wendover, the 509th, leaving Wendover and heading to Tinian in uh, basically in May, May and June, some left in April. Here they are on a C-54, one of the Green Hornets. Uh, all those guys are gonna load on this plane and they'll, they'll take them all to, uh, uh, to Tinian via Los Angeles or San Francisco, Hawaii, Kwajalein and uh, and then over to over to Tinian. So it went over. They continued testing right up until August fifth, uh, a day before the Hiroshima bomb. They built one hundred and fifty five prototype bombs at Wendover. <clears throat> we have we have records of them uh, test dropping uh, between seventy and eighty of those bombs. Some of the assemblies were just put together to see how, how it all went together. And it was a challenge because all of the components came from manufacturers who didn't know the total project. Uh, the, the components were shipped from a man, like the shell of the fat man. The pieces were shipped from a manufacturer to a second site. They'd be repackaged, relabeled, sent to Wendover. And then so Wendover didn't know where they were coming from. The manufacturers didn't know where they were going. There were 400 FBI agents assigned to this 1700 group, 1700 man 509th group, uh, latrine orderlies, uh, cooks, mechanics, uh, pilots, typists, whatever, just to make sure that the secrecy of this project was, uh, was kept. So. And of course, you know, on August 6th and August 9th, what happened, so brought the war to an end. <clears throat> Wendover had a, a <clears throat> much unrecognized to date, but an incredibly important role in that, in that whole project. But after the war, <clears throat> everybody went home and there wasn't anybody left in Wendover and it wasn't practical to continue as the atomic mission. So as the atomic, uh, as a base. So that was all transferred down into Albuquerque to Kirtland. Uh, all the components, fixtures, tooling, and they even picked up some of the buildings from Wendover and took those, uh, took those away. And Wendover uh, then just kind of, kind of faded away. It is interesting to note that all the time that the scientists were flying to Wendover, uh, with new designs and bringing changes and so forth for these prototypes. Uh, there were never any, no records in and out of Wendover. Uh, planes would be given orders to fly to Kingman, Arizona. The pilot knew what he was doing. He'd fly to Kingman, towards Kingman, and then of course he'd come up and fly to Wendover. And even the 216th base unit that built all these prototypes uh, when they were all done, they were not discharged from Wendover. They were discharged from their previous base. So Wendover was kept a secret even, uh, even after it didn't need to become a secret. 
and that uh, that pretty much wraps up the the atomic the atomic missions. It's, there was much more to that, but that's uh, that's very brief. And there there you have it. So as you uh, have been researching researching the field and and uh, uh, the history. Uh, of of the buildings that were there at the at the heyday of of the uh, Army Airfield, what uh, about how many are still in existence today? I know you mentioned a few of them, but but how many are still still around? We've we've got about ninety of the six hundred and sixty eight wow. buildings. So we've got barracks, mess hall, tower, ordnance bunkers. Uh, you know, there, there's a there's a wide mix of what originally was there. And I find that amazing because uh, it, it's. It was pointed out in several of the uh, presentations is these were supposed to be temporary uh, structures that were not supposed to last in the conditions uh, in in Wendover. That's right. Well, Wendover, of course, has a very dry climate, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's partly what saved it. But partly the buildings, uh, particularly those uh, wooden squadron hangars, are extremely well uh, constructed. They really. Uh, you know they've they've obviously lasted right. uh, very well. Um, not to put anyone on the spot, but uh, I've I've always been fascinated by the difference between the, the fat man and the little man uh, uh, bombs. Why were there two such radically different uh, configurations? The the little boy bomb was a gun type bomb. There was a uranium bullet which was fired into a uranium target. And uh, <clears throat> they knew that they knew that was going to work, but after refining uranium for over a year and a half, we only had enough for one bomb, and so they knew they wanted more. So they were working on the Fat Man, which uses plutonium, which is easily converted from uranium in a in a nuclear reactor, and the plutonium bomb took a plutonium core with six thousand pounds of high explosive around it compress that core into a critical mass, and that's what exploded it. They tried the gun type approach with plutonium, but as the plutonium got close to the target, it blew itself apart, just fizzled, and there was no no explosion. So they, they did it out of necessity. We didn't have enough uranium for two bombs. We saw a, a graphic earlier that, that kind of showed the the groups coming together and and somewhat of a timeline for the for the initial training. But uh, about how long did each of those uh, bomb groups were they in uh, Wendover for their training? They were, they were typically here about three months. Okay, that could certainly vary depending on needs overseas and whatnot. And you had the list of of all of those. Were there at the peak, how many different groups were all there at the same time? It's possible we might have had an overlap of up to three. Do you think okay. that's right, Tom? Yeah, yeah, possibly three, but it, yeah, as land as that one picture Landon had, uh, you know, the ramp is full, they've got planes parked down the taxiway of the runway. Uh, so yeah, probably your maximum maximum density is probably three but only for a short short time so what happened to the the field between uh the end of the war and where it is today um actually so we have we've been fortunate to meet a few veterans uh it served as a as a temporary duty base for a number of uh, interceptor squadrons uh one gentleman who very kindly shared his pictures and we have a picture of a bunch of F-102 Delta darts parked on the ramp uh, where they were practicing. Uh, and then actually during the 1980s, uh, the, during the early red flag exercises, Wendover served as an adversary squadron base. So rather than having everyone at Nellis, some fortunate guys got to sleep in World War II bunks and barracks and and uh, really live the life I guess but that's so through the you know temporary duty kind of assignments through the 80s but then after that uh, is just been used as a private uh, well a county airport well and they also 
they also ate their meals in the dining hall, which we're now restoring. So we've got we've got some of their squadron logos on the wall around this dining hall. What are some of the uh, more unique artifacts or, or things you've discovered as as you've been uh, trying to bring the restoration to uh, to life at the field? Um, probably the most unique are leftover parts of the actual fat man and little boy bombs that were dropped. And we've got pieces of like the radar unit that's been crushed. Uh, we've got pieces of the sidewalls, uh, pieces of the fat man uh, core, not the core of the shell. So that, that's, probably, that's probably the most unique. Out on the runway, we have found, or out in the field, there's about 2,200 acres remaining that's now part of the part of the base. But we found air aircraft parts out there. <laughs> so, and uh, and then we've had a number of people donate uh, donate items to us that they used when they were at Wendover. Uh, some of them, like navigators' in instruments from the Atomic Mission Group. So, you mentioned uh, to, that uh, simulation was uh, sort of cutting edge for the for the day. Uh, I've I've seen the A two uh, bomb racks and of course the the link trainer, but I had no idea there was actually a celestial navigation simulator. Uh, how fascinating that must have been at the time to be to be able to to uh, to simulate a, a mission inside a building like that. It it would be even incredible to do today. Right. Yeah, we only that's, wish that we had them left. We're, that's we're one of sure the things. Some of the first. Oh, go ahead, Tom. No, I, I was going to say, as a as a museum group, we we uh, toss back and forth how exactly we could get the uh, donation funds to reconstruct one of those. Because yeah, that that is is as you look at the the, I've never seen a, a real picture of other than the exterior of it. You just see that cutaway drawing. You say. Holy cow, how ingenious. We've actually, uh, we've got all the architectural drawings completed to, to replicate that building. And I have worked with uh, Evans, and, Evans and Sutherland to do a planetarium type projection uh, for that. So we're, we're actually, once, once we find the funds where we can recreate one of those buildings uh, to look like one of the four. That would be amazing. Uh, just a, a couple of minutes left uh, from from each of you. Any any final thoughts before we wrap up? Well, we certainly appreciate the opportunity to tell a few folks what what's going on at Wendover, and of course, we're anybody that wants to come, we're there. Absolutely. That I think that's uh, like like I said earlier. I think uh, regardless if family members or friends trained in Wendover or, you know, Texas or Louisiana, wherever they may have trained. I think the unique thing about Wendover is you can come and really get a sense for what it truly was like to, to live in this 48 bunk open barracks room or eat uh, in a World War II era mess hall or hang out in a uh, enlisted office uh, an enlisted club so it's it's a, it's about the power of place i think yeah as we say you can walk where they walked i mean it's powerful to actually experience this to be here and what we have i mean this range of types of buildings is representative of the training that went on across the country so that's why we're trying so hard to preserve it and restore it um, so certainly we encourage all of you if you want to learn more in the meantime until I think in October is when we'll talk a bit more about our restoration efforts. You can visit us at windoverairbase.com to learn a bit more about our history. We have videos on YouTube. We're pretty active on Facebook, Instagram. We have a pretty good TikTok page going as well. So yeah, be sure to check us out. And if you have any relations to Wendover or your ancestors do, please feel free to share. We'd, we're always looking for more resources and information.
Well, thank you, uh, gentlemen, for, for being here tonight. And uh, yes, as uh, you alluded to, October 6th, Wednesday night, October 6th, we will uh, reconvene and uh, take a look at uh, some of your restoration efforts. Uh, if you've looked online at uh, at some of the uh, the pictures of the before and after, you know that uh, uh, the crews that uh, and volunteers that, that you have working on this project uh, really um, they they must feel the passion and the and the the sense of place that that you talked about uh, in, because you can see it reflected in the in the work that they've done so far. Well, thank you. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> and and I do have to I do have to give a shout out. One of the most memorable experiences I had was when Fifi and Diamond Lil came to Wendover for the 509th Bomb Group reunion, and myself and another guy that was that uh, a, a good part of our group were helping this gentleman across the field and he said i've never been to a reunion and he said i was a tail gunner and as he looked at fifi we looked at him and said How, what was it like and he said i've never thought about it but what an adventure it was and so i i have to credit what the work the commemorative air force does to make those memories for for people come back to so thank you and what an adventure it it uh, it is it uh, continues to be and we're going to find out more on uh, october 6th but that's going to wrap up our session for tonight thank you for joining us for another caf warbird tube webinar if you have any suggestions for future guests or topics you'd like to have us cover just drop uh, leah block an email at media at cafhq.org and we'll be back next Wednesday night, 7 o'clock Central Time. Until then, thank you to our, our guests, uh, Jim and Tom Peterson and Landon Wilkie from historic uh, Wendover Airfield in Wendover, Utah. Gentlemen, have a great night. And for everyone else, for the Commemorative Air Force, I'm Steve Buss. Thanks, everyone.